I want to introduce you to our speaker um, for this month, Christian Davenport, better known as Cubs the Poet, is a modern day wordsmith who considers each day a new painting and a new poem. While he has written poems since 1989, it was later in life that he studied psychology in school. That's when he began thinking for himself, he says. It, it wasn't long before he decided to study life outside the classroom, attempting to unlearn and redefine the meaning of his life while spreading love to others. He began typing poems on a typewriter in the middle of the French Quarter on Royal Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now he's writing his first book, What, what I Did With My Free Time, while also serving as the Poet Laureate of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You can visit his website at CubsThePoet.com. You can visit his Instagram at Cubs the Poet, and you can visit Facebook at Cubs the Poet. Good morning, y'all. Uh, thank you, Jim, for the introduction and also for having me. Um, it's pretty early, so my voice is gonna be shaky and my mind is gonna be everywhere, but uh, bear with me. So first, I, I wanted to have this, um, this on the screen just to show you all how I decided to kind of bullet point or flow chart what I would like to talk about. And I, and I would invite you all to grab a piece of paper or open up a tab and uh, start with the same thing, radical. Um, I'm gonna step back slowly so you can see and then I'll get to talking about uh, kind of this chart and who I am. Oh shit. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Cubs the Poet. Um, I've been, I've, I think I've been writing poetry since Jim said 1989. Um, I have, I guess as I, I'm, I'm 31 now, right? So I have this unique uh, retrospect hindsight uh, perspective when I look back at my life and I realize how my family um, grooms me to be radical. Um, I think, um, my upbringing was super unique in terms of everyone in my family is um, higher education, um, teachers, doctors. So they, they cultivated me, right? So I, I'm, um, let's see where I can start. I guess I'll start with uh, my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, Mimi, she's from Baton Rouge, um, taught me how to read and write. And I, and I think um, by, the way she, by, the, by the energy she had, right, the love she gave, it didn't feel as though she was teaching and I was learning. It felt more like a connection. So I think at that early age when I'm, and I'm jumping right into it, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll bag up and I'll go deep, but I'm just, that's how I am. But um, I realized that um, she was, what she actually was doing was giving me love, right? She was, she was nurturing my nature. She was cultivating who I am um, as, a, as a child. And I think I picked that up and I took, I took that to the classroom. So I remember kindergarten and pre-K. I remember going into the classroom and it feel, feeling cold, right? It, it, felt, it felt cold. I mean, it felt like the teacher, it, I mean, we all know now as adults, we know, we know how uh, school is set up to teach us um, kind of like conveyor belt or like imitation and not really freedom uh, of thought. So uh, as the teachers were talking to me, I, I would fall asleep. I remember falling asleep in class because of of that lack of love and of being bo uh, bored. Um, so I guess uh, moving, and there's so many different ways of explaining kind of that upbringing. But like, um, as I grew up and went to college, it was kind of the same thing, high school. It was all designed to kind of impose and condition the mind, right? So I mean, I, in multiple things, right? Like I went to an um, all black Catholic uh, primary school, elementary school, so I saw how uh, black people uh, were faith-based, um, class-based, socialist. I saw all of I saw all of that, right? I saw. I even saw. Um, it's not fair to really call it racism, but I saw favoritism in terms of different shades of black and different shades of color, right? So then I went to middle school, and that was a predominantly um, Spanish, mainly Sp main, mainly Hispanic. I mean, El Salvadorian, Puerto Rican, Cuban, all different types, and. They, they brought me in and thought that I was of, of that uh, background. Um, so they knew that I wasn't as soon as I opened my mouth. So then I was kind of othered as well in that, but I also saw the breakdown of how different um, accents, different colors, different classes were grouped and um, how, how we all interacted, right? And then I went to a predominantly white high school 
and all of the black people, all of the people of color play, played sports. So when, when I would start to get into conversations, oh, uh, Chris, you don't play sports. You know, what are you doing at this school, private school? Oh, your parents can pay for you. So, so I had, at each step of my life, I had moments that I had to define who I was because of the way um, I presented myself. And, 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 and that's kind of vague and broad, but I mean, um, I think, I think I, as, I, as I look at myself now, I realize how important that upbringing was. My parents were trying to show me that, you know, different groups of people, even though they appear different, we all tend to behave the same when put into this box of education. So in college, I decided to study marketing and business because I wanted to start a school. I wanted to, um, that was the goal, to, to start a school. So I, st I, went, I went straight to marketing because I felt like I knew how to express myself, but I didn't know how to scale it or, or make it um, appealing to people who, who may not understand it uh, initially. So uh, once again, the way school is set up, our teachers were teaching us examples of how people did it in the past, what they thought. Um, they didn't give us room to kind of bring in uh, exactly what was going on at the time into the classroom and try to adapt that and nurture that way, right? Um, so I decided to um, leave marketing and go to psychology. I thought maybe if I could open up my mind even more and identify certain ways of thinking that uh, were personal to me, maybe that would help me uh, develop even more. But same thing, we're taught, you know, Freud, we're taught William James, we're taught Alfred Adler, we're taught all, these, all of these different psycho psychologists in the way that they thought, where is the room for me to develop mine? So I decided to um, drop out and pursue poetry. So uh, I was at Dillard University. Um, so I guess at 11, I guess I think I, I had, I, I, would, I would play the system and I would go to class, but after my first block, I would leave campus and go down to Royal Street and set up my typewriter and start typing, right? At that time, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I actually, I actually skipped a part. Um, junior year, I went back to Maryland uh, for, for summer break, and I was in the basement of my parents' house, and I was sleeping. And, I, you know, I don't know if, if you fall asleep. You know when you fall asleep with the TV on or a, or a podcast or the radio? that uh, kind of seeps into your dreams. Um, I don't know if it was whatever was on that TV, but when I woke up, um, the following morning, something, at, something in my mind posed the question, what do you want to do? And, and immediately it was like a, a just like a response that I don't even think I created, it was just poetry. So I wrote this poem, Do You Like Poetry? Um, and then I took that to, at the time we were in Maryland, Frederick, Maryland. Um, I took that to this, it's like a very small town. It's like one street is where everything is, Market Street. So I took that to Market Street and um, started reciting this poem every day. Uh, I would look people in their eyes, do you like poetry, right? And people, I mean, in, in Maryland and, and, and specifically in Frederick, there is no busking culture. Nobody sets up and plays music. So people didn't, didn't know what the hell I was doing. Like, they're, they're like, well, what do you really want? Or, you know, I can't read, I don't have time for this. Or, no, I don't like poetry. But I think as I did that over and over, I realized I had to break the ice. Um, I had to break the norm, right? These people were going to work. These people were, I mean, going to eat lunch. They were already set up. They set their day up to do what they were doing. And I'm interrupting that flow of whatever they had planned to do. So I, I had to learn how to interrupt that in a way that made them feel I was being genuine and I guess expressing something, right? Before they even heard the poem or kind of registered what I was saying. So I had to like learn the pitch. And so I recited the poem. Um, people would, you know, donate money or they'll say, hey, you know, how can I get a book or, you know, what else do you do? So all of these, all of these questions I started uh, logging because I had no plan. I was just out there doing what I love with this poetry. And so I started logging it and I did that for the entire summer. And then one day this lady uh, came up to me and she said, hey, I want to pay you to recite your poetry to my customers. So I think, I think she was going to pay me like, a, like 100, 150 bucks. And I was like, oh shit, I'm, I'm about to get paid uh, to do my thing. So I walked into her store and she had a, a typewriter. I think this was like a vintage, a vintage furniture and clothing, uh, vintage clothes, mod modern furniture store. So I walked in, I said, hey, can I have this typewriter instead of the money? And then, then from then on, I realized uh, that's, that's what's gonna separate me and also push me into fully commit to this role of, oh shit, I'm gonna write poems for people. Every person is a poem 
that was the disconnect. People, people didn't want to open up initially because they didn't know who I was. So I flipped it. I said, you know, who are you? What would you like a poem about? And then that kind of opened the doors to what I do now. And um, that evolved into um, weddings. I go to weddings and I write poems and make books based on the stories um, that the family and friends have of the couple. And um, so it's, there's so many there's so many ways of like I'm, I'm finally realizing my impact and what it is that I'm supposed to be doing as a poet, as an artist, as a creative. Um, through, through, I mean, from day one, being nurtured through love um, all the way up to doing what I love and helping bring out love in other people. Um, and it's so unique because um, I like, there's so many ways to, uh, I guess, let me just take a, take a break and say that to me, the term radical is love. If you can establish love as quickly as possible, you are now doing something that um, changes the norm, right? Everyone wants to know what you do for work. How, uh, how are you doing? Um, what have you been up to, right? I, I start every conversation or every poem mentally saying I love you to the person that I'm looking at. So then it's the energy is exchanged and people open up like, it, I thought it was a typewriter, but I realized it was just the connection and the energy shifting and connecting back and forth. So I think to me that that's, that's radical. I just wanted to say, say that, but I think through poetry, I realized that's how I can continue my part in, in, in the world. Uh -huh. But let me look at this chart real quick. Cause I want to, I want to, um, stay on, on topic because I can talk all day and, and serve. I don't like making full circles. I just drop stuff and you connect the dots. Um, but so on, on my chart, um, and if y'all had been keeping up and if anything kind of spoke to you and you branched out from radical and made little boxes, that's cool. I would like to know. But um, for me, I have radical. I have the first line out is love. Then the second major box is interaction. And then the third is poetry. And from those boxes, I have other smaller branches. But like I said, with love, love for me, I did this, um, I did this uh, exhibit on July 4th of this year. Um, it was my response um, to George Floyd's murder. Um, it was called Say It, I Love Black People. And it was, a, it was this uh, 60 by 72 inch uh, canvas. And it was a face. Um, and so it was in a church. It was a large church at Peter and Paul. And people would one by one walk in. And when they would walk in, I would greet them. And I would straight up just say, I love you. And to me, that was, it was a challenge because I still have conditions and I still have like uh, projections and assumptions when I see people, but I know kind of where I want to start from with them. And I don't want to, I don't want to get to know anyone through those angles of what do you do? Who are you initially? I just want to try to start with love. So I said, I love you. Right. Some people immediately said it back. Some people put their head down. Some people laughed. Some people, you know, sat with it and then walked to the piece. Um, it was just that one piece in the church. So it was interesting seeing how people would walk around this large space to kind of focus in on this big uh, painting. Some people knelt in front of it. Some people circled it. Um, so that was beautiful to see people. And after, you know, people sat with it, some people would come back and say, I love you too. But, but after they would look at the piece, I would pose the question, do you know any black people? And some people say yes, some people say no. I said, well, today, just call them and say you love them. And people were like, you know, some people say, oh, I'm going to do that right now. Oh, you know, that's interesting. And, and, and I think where I was coming from with that uh, exhibit, I'm pushing the interaction uh, forward or I'm, I'm trying to expand how we connect uh, beyond race. I know I use the word black. I know I use these um, the, the, the constructs, but I, I want people to see beyond that. And I think it's through that establishing of love uh, to connection. Right. Um, but I think the 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 let me see how the right word. The inspiration for that project came from a trip I took in, to Stockholm where I'm it was my first exhibit. Um, and I and I and I, I sat outside of the gallery because I was super nervous and um, I was early and um, I sat outside on this bench and I'm, you know, I'm just chilling in Stockholm. I'm looking at all these people and um, something in my mind said, everybody you look at, just say you love them. 
And that blew my mind. It was like, man, okay, I love this person, oh, because of their shoes, or oh, they look familiar, or they're attractive. And I realized my mind is trying to tell me why I love someone, and that takes away the foundation of it. And I think that that inspired the show, um, Say It, I Love Black People, which then I dedicated to my dad because I realized I had never said I love you to my dad as an adult. And so these are just little things that, that just like break away at, you know, getting us closer to loving ourselves, which is my, my whole thing, you know? Um, and I, I, there's so much more to it, but I think that's kind of a good little, um, and, and, and if you have any questions, let's start with questions. Cause I, I would love to hear if I've, if you need me to go deeper into one thing that I said or clarify something, because I, I do like to just, I like to just let it all out from my experience. Um, I think that's pretty good. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. People are going to start typing in questions. Okay. I'll ask you. Okay. Oh, yeah, but uh, yeah, fuck. Oh. By the way, yeah, follow me uh, on Instagram because I'm one of those artists who actually, um, that's my real life and presentation. Like, I really try to connect with people through Instagram. I don't have a problem saying that because I, I just, I, I speak from a place of truth and love. So it's like, you know, I don't care how many likes a thing gets. I just want it to be felt. So please follow me. I do, I have another show coming up called Runaway Tongue in New Orleans at Felicity Church, uh, December 19th, uh, which will be a, a mix of poetry and, and art. Question one, what took you to Stockholm? Oh, um, that's a crazy story. Um, my partner's sisters studied abroad, so we all went ab abroad to take her. Uh, I ran into a lady, Barbara Bunk, that has a paper shop store. And that's just all coincidence. I just walked in there, she saw my typewriter. She said, you know, what do you do with that typewriter? I said, give me a piece of your paper. And I wrote her a poem and she said, you should come back. And I said, oh, this is impossible. You know, I I'm just here off of the strength of my partner's love, uh, family's love. But um, I had got accepted to a fellowship in Austria, uh, the YCI, the Youth Cultural Innovators. And um, I asked them to fly me early to Stockholm so I could do a show. And they said, okay, so I did a, I did that show before the fellowship. Um, and that was, that was, a, that was like I said, my first ever exhibit. So it was a lot of fun. How do you arrive at a theme for the personal poems that mm. you write for people you do not know? That's a great, that's, see, that's right there, questions. Um, I, I, you know, I have like a, I'm, I'm slowly accepting the idea that I need a questionnaire because I don't like to ask the, the same question to, different people, but like I start with, you know, do you love yourself? Uh, or what do you love about yourself? Is this poem for you or for somebody else? And then I, um, basically I just do an email chain and, I, and based off of your answers um, to those two questions, I'll construct a questionnaire and then read your answers and then write a poem. That's how I've been doing it because of COVID. But normally I'm in person picking up energies or like picking up whatever people say. First, I just start with, you know, what would you like a poem about? Um, and then we just kind of go into questioning and, and I type it up on the spot. I was supposed to type a poem for y'all now, but I don't know if we have enough time. Well, yeah, if y'all want to just throw some words out um, about Radical, um, I'll write a poem and recite it. Freedom. Oh, yeah. Love. Showing up. Action. Respect. Godless. What was that? Godless.
unbothered. Mm. Oh, four. Okay, cool. So then I'll just read it. Um, oh, and I, I invite I invite you all. I forgot I had a mic on, so I'm sorry if I got loud. But I I, I invite you all to close your eyes um, and kind of like let go, let go of all the things you heard um, and what you're thinking, so that you can hear uh, the poem. Um, freedom, freedom freed them. The love of a heart not needing to react, but simply be. Show up, glowed up, respect yourself and not the Franklin, soulful, doubtless. We have never needed Darwin to draw in the dreams, radical, love, liberated the freedoms we fought for, unbothered like a bargain that leaves both people whole. Yeah, by, by Cubs a Poet. <laughs> we have on this yeah. <laughs> I got a... Uh... Couple more, that was beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, I got one question. What was the experience of finally telling your father you love him? As oh, a my God, y'all. That shit was so powerful because cause, um, I'm super close to my dad and my granddad. Like, my granddad was what he passed away, like, when I was 12. But he was he was super. And I'm realizing how he was super soulful because he was quiet. Like, um, <laughs> so when he spoke, you know, you just, you were first off shocked that he was speaking to you, but he spoke from like, like, I mean, he's, he's the type of person that rode in the car without the radio. So like he, it worked, but he didn't play it. And I, I'm just like in awe, but like my dad, you know, my dad had, it's just crazy how powerful, but how soulful my, my family is. Like my dad doing what he did, um, like he studied molecular genetics and ran a restaurant and raised three kids and, and still married to my mom. They met in high school. But anyway, seeing all of that, it kind of overwhelmed me or uh, what's, the, what's the word? It's not intimidation, but it's just, I know how high the stakes are to be who I wanna be, right? Cause he, he kind of is who he is. And so I never really felt uh, reflective or equal, and equal is not the right word, but like eye to eye enough to say, I love you. And then just to be able to say it and then him say it back, oh, that just elevated the whole relationship, you know, it just, it kind of was like a inhale, like I had been inhaling my whole life and I finally got to exhale. And that was some powerful, like just, I'm so appreciative that, you know how you say, you, the, the saying right now is give people their flowers while they're alive. And that's, to me, that's where I'm coming from as a poet. It's like, you know, I know, he, like I, I had a talk with him about, um, I'm the only person that, like he's very successful in what he does, but I'm the only person that could say you're successful as a father. And that blew my mind too, you know? It's like that, that, I think that's all based in love. It's like, you know, like, you wanna see people around you that you care about whole and happy, you know? And so you have to do, you have to do your part, you know, by loving yourself and speaking, you know? But yeah, that, that exchange was powerful, I, I think. Thank you for asking that question. Julie asked, what's your writing process? Do you have any particular routines or rituals? And then Tracy also asked, what kind of typewriter are you using? Well, that's the, the second question is the easier. Um, this is a brother. Um, I love it because I got it in California. I love, I love um, y'all can get them on the internet, but I love like finding people who have them because you get to know what they were used for and like the, just the story behind them. Uh, like I have a bunch of typewriters. This is a Remington from the thirties. And um, it's interesting because like the older ones you have to peck so it slows down your thinking. And then the more modern, like 80s to 90s, you can kind of just type as fast as you want. So you, it's just interesting seeing how the brain works uh, in that regard. That's why I use the typewriter. I mean, it's, it's instant and there's no spell check or no like proof, uh, no like tabs to get distracted. Um, the writing process is interesting. I just did a, um, a, a, a pop up at uh, this museum and somebody asked me the same question and they were like, you know, do you get writer's block or or um, how do you know the next word that you're about to say? And I say, I don't talk to myself when I write. I just, I just let it go. Um, now with my book that's coming out, the, uh, what I did with my free time, that was the first time I ever 
look, looked back at my work and tried to have a thread or like a, a narrative. Um, and then also to kind of um, expand, expand or expound upon certain poems. So it's interesting to use that um, mindset when I'm looking at my, my, my writings, like the editing processes. I, I try to stay away from it right now. I just want to get all the, all the things I have to say out. Um, but uh, that's a good question. I think, I mean, it, that's up to you to find out. You know, I don't, I don't really, I, I'm not in a place to, um, like I even started painting because certain emotions and thoughts can't be put into words. So I paint uh, to, to remain creative and expressive. Um, and that's helped kind of make, make, I guess, me appreciate when I do sit down and write um, that it's time to write. Um, mm -hmm. Does it discourage you that love and connection seem radical today? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know, because like the flip side is, is it's like it discourages me that um, it's like, what is the norm now? Like is hate or complacency or like contentment the norm? And if the opposite right now is love and, and, and I, whatever you attach to love, like whatever, um, freedom, uh, open-mindedness, uh, identities, like if, if whatever you attach to love, and radical, whatever. But like, if that's the opposite of what the norm is now, then I don't, I'm not, I'm not discouraged that um, love is love is where I'm at. You know, I, I, you know, like to, you know, like to me, to me, to know that I, I'm the only artist in my family right now. So for me to know that me being radical uh, led me into this path, then I'm, I'm cool with, with that. Um, you, you mentioned you're the only artist in your family. I don't know if you mean your immediate family or extended family, but I'm, I would be curious to hear you talk about that because I, I have a similar situation where sometimes like my parents and my sister, just like <laughs> it, it's hard to connect on that level. They kind of don't get it, you, you know, as a creative um, and wonder where I came from. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I met my immediate mom, dad, brothers, um, like, you know, like my family, my mom and dad were so strict in terms of education being like the way out, the key, the thing nobody can take from you. And, um, I saw how hard they worked. Um, and I kind of associated any, any negative experience in my life. Like if they didn't have time to hang out, I associated it with, Oh, it's because, you know, they're, they're working or they're, they're at school. Like my parents had me when they were 21 and 22. So I, I went to school with my dad while he was like in postdoc and all of that stuff. So I, I, I have like, so that's kind of the, 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 the foundation of like why I pursued uh, art so, so adamantly and like rebelliously. Like I was super rebellious in high school to like, to do what I want to do, you know? And at the time it was rap and like dress, uh, make clothes. But um, I think as I got older, and I realized that that's my role in my family. So I didn't, I didn't take it like a burden. I just, I, I wore it like that's what I'm here to do. And it took a long time for me to even like want to recite poetry to my family. You know, like my, my show Runaway Tongues is kind of bringing together Christian Davenport and Cubs the Poet. Like I'm writing poems for my dad, my mom, my grandma and having them recite it so they can kind of feel like why I'm doing what I do and kind of the impacts of like why I chose this. And it's not just me trying to be rebellious and be the artist and be like the, the radical <laughs> or the free, like the free thinker It's more so like, this is just who I am in terms of not only what y'all have made me to be, but also who I've been, you know, like gifted to be. Um, and I have to like own it and, and like people say, show up for it. Um, Cause I think it inspires my little brothers to, and it, in my friends, it inspires people to know that I'm still doing poetry and art for this long. And, and, and I don't have like a plan B, you know, like this is the only thing that I'm doing. Um, so I think they're respecting it uh, now, but initially it was kind of difficult to, to step out there and like be a writer and a poet and an artist. Um, have you, have your, you, your art, your process or routine been altered by the pandemic? If so, how? Um, well, I was altered in the beginning. I realized how much of my life was set up 
to distract me from work. Like, you know, I would say I want to go to the bar so I can like be with my friends and be social and, and kind of get inspiration. But I realized when I didn't have that, I went internal and I finished my book. Um, I started focusing more on my art. Um, and I think as people kind of like, my, my partner uh, says like, you know, as people started sitting in their house, they realized they wanted to new things. So I got more business for art and poems. Uh, as people, like I, like I did the, I did the 88 poem project, which highlighted um, all of the black people that were killed by cops. So, I mean, that sold out in like an hour. I mean, I, I, I went past, not only did I go past 88, I mean, which is uh, a shame to say because there were more than 88 people who died, but there were more than 88 people who wanted to support the project as well. And that project really um, took a toll on me because I had to watch the videos, I had to read about these people. And I saw, I saw that and then I had to write the poem and give it to the people that purchased them. So it felt full circle in terms of like people really wanting to support not only me, but support uh, like racial injustice and all the things that were happening and still happening at the, at the, at the beginning of the pandemic and America and now, but like, um, it didn't really, it didn't really alter. It just, I guess, elevated what I'm, what I did and made me a little more intentional with how I connect with people because I can't see them in person. So it kind of helped, uh, and I guess altered is a good word to adapt. Yeah. All right, friends, if there are no more questions, we're going to ask everybody to unmute themselves so that we can give Cubs the poet, AKA Christian Davenport, a big hand for being here with us and sharing, uh, sharing his experience and his story with us today. So one, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes.